So let's start this off. Uh, today we're going to talk about exploring C Sharp 8, the deep dive. My name is David Pine. You can follow me on Twitter at DavidPine7. I hope that you do. And if you do, please take pictures and tweet them at my handle so that my wife knows I'm actually here today. Uh, you can follow my blog at davidpine.net where I blog about all the things, uh, almost too much, too many things, right? I blog about C Sharp, I blog about Angular, TypeScript, the, uh, the idea of imposter syndrome, I blog about building magic mirrors for fun, and all those things, right? So check that out. So we're gonna start with a few notes from Microsoft, a few things that you should know about C Sharp 8. So most of the features are implemented entirely in the C Sharp compiler, which is a huge advantage. Um, but some of those uh, features are not available. Uh, they actually require .NET Standard 2.1 or .NET Core 3.0. And sorry, but uh, default interface implementations, uh, that requires an entirely new runtime. So you'll need uh, .NET Core 3.0 for that. Um, and it won't even be shipped as part of Net Framework 4.8. So just a bit of housekeeping about some of the features. So we're going to start looking at uh, async streams. Uh, and we're going to cover some of the, the, the types that were added and kind of justify why some of these features require uh, changes under the covers, right? So there are some new types that were added. So we have a new system dot I async disposable. Everyone should be familiar with I disposable now if you're a .NET developer. Just real quick, show of hands, who's a .NET developer, right? Obviously, thank you for attending my talk. Uh, we have system.iasync enumerable of T and iasync enumerator of T. Then we have ranges, right? So they added system.range and system.index. And we'll get into more details on what these actually look like in code itself. But those are just some of the new types that were added and some of the reasoning why uh, not everything can be just magically there from the compiler. So since the default interface methods, um, I'm not able to show you what those look like in code, uh, like from the IDE, Visual Studio itself, I'm gonna show you on slides instead. So I want you to imagine for a second that we have an interface, an I data repository of T, and we have a simple create uh, method, void returning that takes a T value and obviously does something, right? As a repository would do, it would create that, persist it somewhere. So now imagine that we want to add a new API. As it stands today, right, prior to C Sharp 8, what would this do? This would cause a problem. You'd probably lose friends in the process because if you're adding things to an interface, you're potentially breaking uh, implementations that you know, implement that. So we want to add a create all given uh, an array of T values. So what default interface methods is proposing is the ability to, in our interface itself, provide that default methodology, right? We're actually, we have logic in here. And you'll notice that it's actually referring to create, which is something that's already on the interface itself. So this is gonna be kind of an opt-in thing where implementers can override this by providing their own implementation. That's kind of like magic, right? That's pretty cool. I also want to take a second to talk about target type new expressions. So this is something else with C Sharp 8 that's going to be very interesting and compelling. So imagine we have a, cl a point class. We've got a couple properties off of it, x and y. And we have a constructor that's given an x and y. And then we have this deconstruct. Now deconstruct, if you've been following along with C Sharp, C Sharp uh, has become open source. And the language itself, the design team, uh, allows anyone in the community to you know, provide proposals, right? Pull requests, features, things that they want to do. And you know, it's an open dialogue. And they encourage that. And I think that's extremely um, powerful. But, some of the things that they've been doing is they've had point releases. So if you've been following along with C Sharp, like C Sharp 7, 
7.1, 7.2, 7.3, they've introduced uh, the concept of uh, tuples into the system. And with that, tuples had uh, this magic um, method name called deconstruct. So on anything that's not a tuple, you can say um, public void deconstruct, and you can provide some out parameters. And as long as it compiles, right, and you're assigning to those uh, out parameters, you can walk up to that instance and deconstruct it as if it was a tuple, which is pretty amazing. So what we can do with this uh, point class, right, it's not a tuple, in this point class we can say, um, have an instance of it and deconstruct it and have those X and Y values available to us. Another thing that I added here has been in, the, uh, in .NET for a long time, in C Sharp for a long time, and that's a public static implicit operator. So implicit operators are pretty powerful. Again, they've been around for a very long time. Just real quick show of hands, who's used an implicit operator? A couple people? We'll see why that's important in a second. But basically, it allows us to implicitly treat the tuple literal x and y as a new instance of a point, right? So today we might write, um, we might declare a point array points equals this, this new uh, array of points, right? What they're proposing with target type new expressions is since the type is known from our declaration, we can omit the type itself, right? So we can say simply new, um, open friends, close friends, and then X and Y. Is that pretty cool? You guys think that would be like a nice feature to have? What's really interesting is they're introducing this with C Sharp 8, but with the implicit operator that I've shown you, if we were to take it a step further, we could say point array points equals new point array, and because of the implicit operator in tuples, we can omit new and point altogether, right? So we just literally have what looks like tuple literals, which is, I think, awesome. So we're gonna jump into Visual Studio 2019. We're gonna spend a lot of time in here, and this is gonna be the bulk of the talk. And we're gonna work through various C Sharp 8 features, and one thing I wanna preface this with is that I'm fairly opinionated. So, and I'm empathetic. I'm, by title, a technical evangelist, but I empathize with developers who are constrained to uh, the limitations of you know, the bureaucracy of enterprises or large teams and those types of development environments where you might have limitations with what it, you, know, you can use and things like that. So one thing I like to do is I like to put this chip on my shoulder and say, these features are amazing, right? And most people will come up here and tell you that. But, there's always a but. Like, how does it apply to you? What's practical? Why do you want to use it? What are the actual advantages of it? Just because it's new and shiny doesn't mean you should be using it. So we're in Visual Studio 2019. I've got a C Sharp 8 project. And to cl uh, clarify a bit, I'm going to zoom in and show you something that you may or may not be aware of. So if we right click on the project and we say properties, and we head over here to uh, application and click build. Um, in the properties tab, if we go down towards the bottom, there's this advanced tab. We click on that. This actually is where you can select the various version of C Sharp that you want to target, right? So this project can now target C Sharp 8 beta. So that's good. So this C Sharp 8 application is a simple council app. It's nothing uh, to write home about. It's not super exciting. We are using uh, John Skeet's demo utility. Just show of hands if you know who John Skeet is. I assumed as much. And what it allows us to do is basically have um, various main entry points in different classes, and it's a way to kind of orchestrate demo code for C-sharp council applications. So uh, let's start with async streams. So uh, our async streams, one thing I like to do real quick is 
there's a bunch of confusion in the community right now about async streams in particular. They'll think of them as being somewhat related to the idea that reactive extensions offers. With reactive extensions, it's basically an implementation of the observer and observable pattern, right? So the key differences with uh, I enumerable and I async enumerable is that those are pull based, right? So we're pulling stuff and processing them as quickly as we can. With the observer uh, pattern in Rx, what you have is like a subscription type of pattern where things are being pushed to you. So you subscribe and provide like an on next as like a callback. Some of the issues with that are like the concept of back pressure and how do you handle that, right? Since you're uh, not necessarily the consumer of that, right? You're being pushed to uh, and you have no control of how many times you get pushed to. Whereas the, the opposite way of, you know, just pulling it. So, so I want to show you that we have a simple struct, uh, a statement that has an ID and a description, and we have um, the ability to return them uh, this way. I want to just do a real quick review of the concept of I enumerable. So with I enumerable, there's a special keyword that you can add to I enumerable returning uh, functions that is yield. So who's written iterators before? Who's used the yield keyword? Okay, this is great, good. A lot of times people don't raise their hands, so I like to cover that. So what this means is that this block of code is going to be uh, treated as an iterator. So it's deferred execution. And that means that it's not going to be executed until this I enumerable is materialized, until we either call like to array or to list or for each over that collection, right? So one of the general questions we'll ask is like, if error was true, which I don't know why we'd ever in production code have a true situation where we're throwing like this, but bear with me. If this was true and we were to throw an exception here and I was to call get statements, what would happen? The correct answer is nothing, right? You get your I enumerable back and until you start to materialize it, um, that, at that point in time, that's when that exception is actually thrown. So that could be way later on. So we have uh, an, a task returning of I enumerable statements, right? Just demonstrating that. And this was pre C sharp eight, so you'd imagine how uh, now, you know, the, with the future of what C sharp is doing, we wanted to, you know, try to join these two worlds with tasks, uh, task-based parallel, or sorry, task-based asynchronous programming allows us to represent uh, the execution of code, right? So we're basically saying this is going to happen and it's gonna, it can happen asynchronously, right? So it's, it offers up the potential for suspended execution. So now we're merging these two concepts, right? We have these new types, so we look at I async enumerable, so we can get state, statements uh, asynchronously and we're gonna return I async enumerable. So that's allowing our, uh, our async methods to also have the yield keyword in them. So this is basically joining the concept of deferred execution with the potential for suspended execution, right? So we have a stopwatch here and we'll get statements. So the statements is an I async enumerable of statement. We can iterate over those. Notice that when we iterate over them, we're saying await for each, right? So this syntax is familiar but also new. And then we're just gonna print out the elapsed time for each of those statements. So let's run this real quick. Let me bump the size up on that real quick also. zero, and then basically every second we'll, we'll pump out the evaluation of those asynchronously awaited and deferred execution um, all, all married. So that's, that's basically async streams, which is pretty cool, all right? So one thing that is also very cool, but also not cool, and that is nullable reference types. 
And I say it's not cool because to me, when I first heard the concept of nullable reference types, it was terrifying. I thought to myself, what is the C Sharp team smoking? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> like, you know, quite frankly, what are they doing? Why are they thinking of, of this as an idea? Like, what, to me, reference types have always been nullable. So to explicitly state that, null, you know, reference types are nullable, it didn't really compute with me. I knew that nullable uh, was something that was introduced around value types, right? Structs, we could say we have a, a questionable date time, right? With the question mark, and that made it nullable. Um, but reference types, that didn't really make sense. So what's the big advantage here? And one thing that we like to, to do as developers is talk about the notion of the billion dollar mistake. So show of hands if you've heard of this concept, the billion dollar mistake. And this is coming from the inventor of null. He says it's the billion dollar mistake. And as a .NET developer, I will guarantee you that you have had a null reference exception at one point in time, right? An object reference not set to an instance of an object. Just show of hands, who has dealt with that? Probably too often, right? So what this feature is looking to do is to help alleviate that problem. It's helping to alleviate that concern some by having the power of our IDE light up and start saying, you know what, you didn't think of this case here. You should be more defensive in your coding. So in this specific example, I have a pound nullable, so a compiler directive. And I'm gonna say enable. We're gonna look at how our IDE starts lighting up a bit. So we have a person class with first name, middle name, and last name. And we have two constructors, one of which, which is just taking the first and last name. So we know from the constructors itself that we're not explicitly assigning to the middle name. And the IDE knows that also. So the IDE is gonna tell us that we have a potential uh, problem, right? A non-nullable property middle name is uninitialized. So what can we do, right? What we can do is we can really express our intent. So we can say that middle name, the string here, we can say middle name is questionable, right? So how does that change what our IDE might do in terms of IntelliSense further down the pipeline, right? So Let's exemplify that. So we're gonna instantiate a person, we got Miguel, and we have a function that gets the length of the middle name of a given person. And this is coming from uh, C Sharp 7 where they introduced uh, local functions. So we're gonna get the, the, the length of the middle name, and here the IDE is telling us more about that, right? Let's zoom in again, and it says, one thing you'll notice is I say string. Who likes to use string versus like var, for example? Who, who likes var, I guess? That's a better question. Great, I'm a var advocate. I, I prefer that because I'm lazy, right? As developers, I think we're all lazy, so var is less than saying like dictionary of string of dictionary because we have nested dictionaries for some odd reason, right? So we have a string here. This is our middle name. We're saying it's a string middle name equals uh, person dot middle name. Uh, and one thing you'll notice is that the middle name is actually a questionable string, right? It's a nullable string. So we're expressing our intent, right? We're telling, we're giving some hints that we are explicitly stating that the middle name can be null and should be treated as such, you know, considering flow analysis. So we have this person middle name and we're saying, okay, this is not what we're looking for, so we'll use var instead. So that, that concern goes away. But now we have middle name here, and it says we have a possible dereference of a null reference, right? Because we don't, we don't know for sure um, if that's null or not. So what, what can we do? Well, let's just use the Elvis operator and then coalesce over to zero. And now we've written code defensively, right? So the, the, the main advantage here is that we're taking something that's uh, you know, a class, in this case a person class, 
with the variance of a middle name and we're explicitly stating that it can be null and as such, we should treat it that way. So wherever it's being used, the compiler can queue on that and say, aha, here's some suggestions, right? It's not perfect and it's gonna be very earth shattering. I was reading a, a blog post by John Skeet where he talks about how this, if you start turning this on in all your solutions, for example, if you start moving over to C Sharp 8, it's going to potentially have the same effect or wow factor as async await did, right? It's gonna be massive. It's going to upheave the masses and it's gonna be something that shouldn't be taken lightly. But the goal is to help developers write more defensive code and to hopefully end up in a state where we're not having the frustration of null reference exceptions. Cool? All right, so let's talk about pattern matching. There's a question? Yep. You could do the same thing with, I mean, so string is a special case. But yeah, we, we come to me afterwards and we'll talk more about that. Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about pattern matching and some of the enhancements with pattern matching specifically. So we have a um, public enum rainbow and we're defining red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet as we'd expect from uh, an enum. We have an RGB color class that holds uh, a byte for the red, green, and blue values. So we're gonna look at switch expressions. So imagine that we want to have a way to convert uh, the rainbow into the corresponding RGB color. So we have a switch on that you know, definite type, right, the enum value, and we will return the RGB color instance. Right, that's, that's how we do it today. So with um, switch expressions, one of the things that we can do is now we can, let's say, metaphorically speaking, we're gonna taste the rainbow. Things are gonna get better, right? So we have that same rainbow color, and we can express this as, uh, notice how the syntax has changed. So rather than saying switch, open and close parens on that type, we're saying, uh, here's the type, now we're going to switch on it. And our case labels are a lot more terse. So rather than saying case and having you know, our uh, colons, we simply have the value, right? So rainbow red is expressed as the new RGB color, right? So it ends up being a lot um, more terse, less, less verbose, right? More expressive. I think it's a lot less boilerplate. It's easier to read, in my opinion. And then we've introduced the notion of discards, which are special. So this is basically the, the, the fall through of um, no, no case was matched, so we're gonna throw an exception. So we, now we have a, an address class, and we have some various properties, right? We've got the uh, address line one and line two, a city, a state, postal code, uh, the country and region. So I wanted to show you now uh, property patterns. And what's really amazing about property patterns. So imagine that we want to uh, compute sales tax based on an address. So we have a sales price. We're going to express that also, right? So we can walk up to the location and say switch on it, but now we can evaluate individual properties on that instance as part of our switch expressions, right? So we can say location switch and then evaluate what the state is. So if the state is uh, Washington, here's the sales tax, right? Or if it's uh, Wisconsin, but then also the city is Milwaukee, right? We can treat that differently. And this is where specificity comes in, right? Same as all the case labels that we've ever written in switch statements before, right? The order matters. So if we're in Minnesota, we're just gonna say it's too much. And if we fall through, um, we don't have anything, right? Pretty cool. Let's talk about tuple patterns now. Tuple patterns are just another way to express our, our switch statements here with pattern matching. So we have a simple game of rock, paper, scissors. 
And the first and second argument are either rock or paper, um, right? Rock, paper, scissors, any of those options. So we can switch and say on this tuple itself, right, evaluating this tuple, uh, what are the various case labels that we would define for that? And those are expressed as such, right? And we can just say that we're gonna return a string. So we'll switch on that tuple. And if the first one's rock, rock obviously covers paper, right? So we can say rock covers paper, paper wins, or is covered by paper. Uh, rock versus scissors, paper versus rock, so on. You get the idea, right? And if we end up down here, we can just say tie, if they're ever the same. So let's talk about um, a little bit more in depth here. So we have uh, a shape. And our shape defines a height and a length, as any good shape should. It's got the constructor, right? So we've got our height and length. And then we have some subclasses. We've got a circle that defines a radius and a diameter and a circumference. And then we have a rectangle that says it's a square if the height and width are equivalent, right? So otherwise, it's still just a rectangle with its height and length. So we can pattern match on uh, objects also. This was pre-C Sharp uh, 8 specifically, but still really cool to talk about how we can use it in this context with switch expressions. So we can walk up to a shape and get the various details from it. So we'll say shape switch, and if uh, it is the type circle, we have it inside that expression, right? We have it as C. So in the scope of this case, lab case labels, like, you know, expression, C is available. It's not only available, but it's of type circle, so it has everything hanging off of it that we'd expect, which is super cool. We can say rectangle S when uh, S is a square, right? So we're saying more explicitly that, yeah, it's a rectangle, but it's also a square. So in this instance, we have a square. We know for sure that those uh, height and length are gonna be equivalent in this expression. Otherwise, we can fall through to a rectangle. Otherwise, we can just say, discard it, it's an unknown shape, and just throw our hands up and walk away from it, right? So this was part of um, the initial slide deck where I showed this point class. So let's kind of skip past that. Uh, but I, I, I just want you to remember that we do have a point class, right? It's got X and Y on it, um, and we can deconstruct it. But then we also define another uh, enum for a quadrant, right? So we have unknown, we've got origin, quadrant one, you know, two, three, four, right? So just imagine that, or you're on a border. So we have uh, positional patterns as well. So we can say, um, you know, take a point and say from that point, we can plot out a quadrant. So we can say point switch, and since we're able to deconstruct this point into a tuple literal, we can have those as case labels, right? So let me say that again. Since we have a point instance, and that point object defines a deconstruct uh, method that outs both the X and Y, we can express that point as a tuple literal. So we have a tuple literal, and those can serve as our case labels, right? So our case labels are zero and zero, and that's expressed as quadrant dot origin, right? Smack dab in the middle. Or we can say var X, Y, when X is greater than zero and y is greater than zero, then we're obviously up in quadrant one, right? And so on and so forth. And we can just plot that out. Um, we can discard here at the very bottom and say we're unknown. Uh, there's a question. So yeah, the question was, what's the difference between 255 and 256? Uh, discarding here is, um, so this, so the difference is that with the statements above, they are more explicit. And if we fall through to a situation where they're the same, but don't meet these conditions, it'd be on a border. So imagine a, a situation where it's one and one. Um, so it would fall to on 
or I'm sorry, one and zero, right, it'd fall on a border. Um, otherwise, it falls to unknown. Uh, there was another question about exhaustive checking. I'm honestly, I don't know offhand. I'd have to look into that more. Ah. Does not complain. Right, I'm not sure. So let's, uh, let's catch up with me afterwards and we'll dig into more things. Cool. Uh, so let's look at uh, ranges and uh, indices. So this is one of the things that, uh, while I was super excited about all the things that were offered up with pattern matching, uh, because I enjoyed when they added pattern matching to C Sharp 7 and, and furthermore with the point releases, um, there was, a, a bit of, I guess, confusion uh, around ranges specifically, and uh, there's some niceties to them, but it's going to take a bit of time for people to start writing uh, ranges, I think, you know, right off the bat. I, I know that I still look at them and I get confused, so there's some uh, advantages to it, but they, they introduced the concept of a hat operator, so we have uh, hat, so if we have a whole bunch of words, right? The, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Uh, obviously, in any programming language today, we have the notion of arrays. So we have a string array here. And at index zero, we have the. And index one, we have quick and so on and so forth. You get the point. Uh, but with the hat operator, we could say hat nine, right? That is also equivalent to the in this case because we're starting at the end of the ray and working backwards. So, oh look, uh, the IDE has suggestions. So, uh, let's, who, who's written code like this before where you try to get like the last element in an array, right? So you'll say words, um, you know, br uh, brackets, words that length minus one. So now what the IDE is suggesting is using, uh, indexing can be simplified. Right, so it's gonna say instead, write it this way. Or we have words hat one, which I think is a lot more expressive. And as long as you start wrapping your head around the concept of the hat operator you know, indicating from the end, it's really, it's a nicety, right? So then we can walk up to words and we can say uh, dot, or sorry, one dot dot four, and this is a range, so we're saying in this array, pick out a range of values, uh, one through four, and so we'll end up with, uh, that's exclusively, so we'll end up with the quick brown fox, right? Here we have what's known as range phrases. And a range phrase is essentially a literal, so we say hat two dot dot, and this is the last two of something, right? So this is how we declare that type, and it's an assignment. You'll notice that these are actually read-only structs. So I, I explicitly typed it here and said range, last two, so I could show you how they kind of broken apart the concept of ranges and indexes. So that range phrase is equivalent to an instance of a range, which is a read-only struct, and the range type itself has a start and end index object, and that inject, uh, index object is also a read-only struct. So we have the start and the end, and those uh, indexes have, uh, is from end bit, right, a bool that says whether or not it's from the end, and the corresponding value. So that's how they kind of modeled ranges and indexes. So again, we have range phrases and we can use those. We can use those as literals within, uh, again, the context of an array trying to cherry pick things out of that as we want. We can ex declare and assign them as such here and then use those instances into uh, an index here. So we can say words, the last two. So then we have line, string, 
dot join with an empty space, we're just going to pick out the last two. So of the words up here, we have lazy dog, right? So we'll get lazy dog and we'll, we'll splot those on the screen. So if we wanted everything, we could just say dot dot, which I don't know why you would want to do that. You can say dot dot four, right? So we can get the through uh, fox. You can get the last phrase, right? So the last phrases, six dot dot, and get lazy dog. And let's just plot those on the screen real quick for you to see. So yeah, the last word is dog, and we cherry picked out a uh, quick brown fox. Uh, we had lazy dog, right? So you, you kind of get the point how you can interact with uh, ranges and indexes and cherry pick things out of arrays. So I'm curious, just yes or no question, do you think that's useful? Yeah, show of hands. Do you think it's confusing? Do you think if you had some really elaborate range phrases that your friends, you know, your developer peers who are doing code reviews would appreciate that? No? <laughs> uh, there was a question in the back here. The question was, uh, indexes are zero base and ranges are one base? Is that what you said? Yeah, so there, yeah, there's, there's been confusion and discussion on Twitter and on uh, internal emails and stuff like that. Uh, yes, there, there's still, yeah, so from the end, it's, it's one based, yep. If you, yeah, if you did hat zero, I don't, I don't know if that's valid, yeah. Come up to me afterwards and we'll play. We'll play around. All right, uh, so lo local functions. Uh, let's jump into that real quick. So who's used local functions before? Who's nested a bunch of local functions and lost friends? <laughs> don't do that. Uh, all right, so local functions are pretty cool. Uh, when I first saw them, I was uh, very hesitant the idea of having local functions expressed within a, a method body that were defined after a return statement was concerning to me. It looked weird, it didn't feel natural, it felt like this is unreachable code, right? It's not gonna compile. But that's local functions. Uh, local functions are pretty powerful, they do some pretty amazing things, uh, and they were introduced with C-sharp 7, but now that we're in C-sharp 8, they're adding a new, uh, concept to them, and that's uh, static locals. And it helps with a specific problem. So uh, who's, who's heard of the concept of implicitly captured variables, right, uh, beyond, you know, a closure, right? So uh, in this scenario, we have a classic uh, capture example where we have a local function, right? So we have int i, and we have a local function, again, defined, in this case, beneath our return statement. So we're going to say, uh, return y, and our local function is basically the expression of y equals 19, because let's keep it very, very simple. So when we invoke this, we'd expect it to be, y would be 19, right? But it's doing something very interesting because the local function is actually capturing y, kind of beyond the scope. It's inside its own local method scope, or local function scope. And this could be problematic for reasons. Uh, so now what they've introduced is the concept of static locals. So imagine something very similar where we have an int uh, y and x, you know, uh, five and seven, and we want to add those, right? So return add uh, x and y, and that's defined statically as int add left and right, and it's simply that expression, left plus right. But if I was to come down here and say y, for example, this will actually not compile. It's gonna say the static local function cannot contain a reference to y, right? And that's a good thing, 
that's a good developer saying, I explicitly do not want others to come in here and potentially capture those variables unintent, you know, and, and mess up the world, basically. So that's, that's static locals, and I think it's a good ad, an, uh, advancement. But again, going back to the chip on my shoulder with some of the features, local functions have been one of those kind of pain points where I've, I've debated whether or not uh, they're good and they're useful, and part of me likes them, part of me is still not a fan of them. I like how they're not nearly as ugly, right? So we could write this same type of function down here as an actual function, and how much uglier would this be if we said func, oops, not that, func, give me that, yes, int, give an int, give an int, right? Uh, call it plus, and that equals int a and b expressed as a, oh yeah, we don't need those. Right, so you get the point. Who, who likes writing stuff like this? Is this, is this better for anyone? Who, who likes being, um, you know, typing out funk? Another pop quiz is of, you know, funk of TTT, where those are all ends, which actually is the one that's the return, right, versus which are the two parameters in. So I think there's, you know, there's some give and take. Um, and I, I tend to like local functions for that reason, right, because they're not as ugly. And uh, it, it's still, it looks very much like C sharp without some of the, you know, ugliness of funks and actions and stuff like that. All right, so we're gonna talk about using declarations. Uh, using declarations are a very interesting one. Um, as a .NET developer, eh, you're most likely familiar with iDisposable and the uh, concept of using statements, right, and how you would uh, have that convenience functionality within the syntax to say we're going to use an instance of this new disposable implementation and outside of the method, you know, that, that scope of the execution, it'll be disposed, right? So under the covers, there's a try finally that's calling dispose on that instance for you, and that's nice. Uh, but what we have, um, you know, discovered as, as .NET developers, right, it's very simple to, to write that, and we're used to it, and we're accustomed to it. Uh, with C Sharp 8, though, they have this notion of uh, implicitly disposing of things when they're out of scope. So this is how you'd write it today, but with C-sharp 8, imagine writing it like this. Using var file equals new stream writer, blah, 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 blah. And then, right, you don't have the brackets. And for me, I have like this innate fear where I think to myself, how do I know that this is actually gonna dispose? And it kind of feels icky, right? It almost feels like I like, I like being explicit. I like saying, you know, here's, here's my um, angle brackets, my curly braces, and I know that that's going to work. So I'm very torn with this. I think personally with the code that I'll be reviewing and writing, I will not be using this feature, but that's just me, that's my opinion. I know that under the covers it's going to work. It's gonna work the exact same way. Um, I don't know how others feel about it though. Is there, is there fear, do you, would you be fearful of this? Does it look like it might open the door to potential mistakes? Show of hands, okay, yeah, cool. I'm not alone then, that's good to know. <laughs> awesome, so that's, yeah, that's basically a walk through most of those. Um, let me jump back in here. So we're gonna recap. So just a summary, high level, right? We saw uh, the improvements with pattern matching where we looked at the various uh, new advancements in how we can express, you know, with switch expressions on individual properties, with positional, uh, with tuple literals, we can get very, very expressive. And I think that's a huge win. I, I for one, love the improvements to pattern matching. I think it's gonna go a long way. It's going to really bolster the language. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of async streams. I think there's definitely use cases for that if you've been following along with .NET Core and SignalR. I've got a talk tomorrow on SignalR, so come check that out. Um, but some of the new primitives that the team's been coming up with, you know, channel readers and writers, uh, some of the, uh, they're gonna be able to start leveraging some of the async stream methodology, which is gonna be super impactful. Uh, nullable reference types. Uh, another interesting one, again, I think the premise behind it is pretty solid. It's gonna start helping developers, but it's gonna be a big change. So I think with that feature in particular, you can start doing it in bite-sized chunks. If it's Greenfield, obviously start out of the gates with trying to, to uh, incorporate that uh, right away. We looked at the new range and index types and how those can be applied and potentially some of the initial complexity around how you'll express those. Um, and there's already been debate and chatter in the audience here as we've talked about that. We looked at the advancements with static local methods and how we can prevent potential concerns with consumers of, uh, that might fall into the trap of capturing something, uh, implicitly ca capturing something they shouldn't. We discussed the implicit uh, dispose and using declarations, right? And some of my fears were expressed very obviously with that. We looked at default uh, interface methods. One thing to note about that specifically is that this concept of default interface methods was borrowed from Java. They've been doing it for a long time, and this is probably the only time I'll mention it during a C-sharp talk, right? You don't really usually talk about Java. Uh, and then we looked at target type new expressions, which are uh, pretty cool, but also you can kind of do things potentially even better with some of the older technologies of C Sharp, right, with implicit um, operators. And with that, uh, these are the resources, some of the things that I looked at to help build out some of the demonstration code here. Uh, there are uh, articles at the top here. The first one's what's new in C Sharp 8. This is a bit.ly link for the Microsoft official documentation. And then building C Sharp 8 is kind of more of an insider view. This is a blog from Mads Torgensen, who is the lead C Sharp designer out at Microsoft. And with that, uh, thank you so much for having me. This is my first NDC talk. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>